What a very, very warm welcome to you guys. Hi, it's Kasim and welcome to Notes on the Topic of. And in today, out today, in today's show, I want to talk to you on the notes and share with you notes on this topic of looking over my shoulder. Once again, I want to share with you some notes and some thoughts and things that I've been thinking about on the topic of looking over my shoulder. Um, I firstly want to begin off by thanking you very much for watching. I want to thank you very much for joining me. Um, and I hope over the next kind of anywhere between 40 minutes to the next 60 minutes, I share some thoughts with you that perhaps can elevate your life, that perhaps can elevate your thinking, that in some way can help you to become a higher, fuller expression of who you're capable of becoming. Um, as usual, guys, if you want to join um, our community and you want to get more of these videos, then I ask you to like and subscribe to my channel, Casamotive on YouTube, because that's where I put most of my content, and you'd be an absolute legend in trying to support me and help me achieve my dream of helping a billion men to become higher, fuller expressions of who they're capable of becoming. Okay, so I want to begin by sharing some notes with you. And making some statements. You can make other statements whatever you will. But I want to begin by sharing with you some things, some statements that I wrote down that I found really interesting on this topic. The first thing that I wrote down is that life is not just a passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, each with its own frequency. I repeat, life is not just a passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, each with its own frequency and intensity. That leads me to the second note that I wrote down here. And I wrote down that no one ever said that life was going to be easy. Life is driven by hard work and obligations. Obligations to truth, to justice, and to liberty. I repeat, no one ever said that life was going to be easy. Life is driven by hard work and obligations. These obligations are obligations to the truth, to justice, and to liberty. The third statement that I want to uh, finish off by, uh, uh, by sharing with you that I wrote down is that life is really simple, but men insist on trying to complicate it. I repeat, life is really simple, but men insist on trying to complicate life. You know, one of the biggest realizations that I made in my life and was quite a profound day was one of these what I call defining days in my life. I define a defining day to be uh, a day where you have a revelation, where information that was already uh, in, in the world or was already uh, within your reach, you never actually had access to, but now all of a sudden you've had access to it or you've all of a sudden actually realized an error that you were making and you decide when that moment happens, you decide to make a choice to go in another direction. I love what Jim Rohn very many years ago said. Jim Rohn said that whilst you may not, if you, if you want to change your life, whilst you may not be able to change your destination overnight, you can change direction. That if you actually want to change your life, if you decide that the current path that you've been going on no longer serves you, if you decide that you've got to a point in your life where you're saying, do you know what, Kasim, I don't like the person who I've been over the last kind of 20 years or so. My attitude, yes, it's who I've always been, it's who my family uh, have always thought me to be, it's who my friends have always thought me to be, but it is no longer serving the kind of life that I wish to, to live. It is no longer leading me to the kind of uh, end which I wish to, uh, to, to be able to boldly say this was a good life. It's not leading me down a path where I can be proud of the kind of man that I have become. And human beings are the only uh, species on this planet who can do this. We've been given this incredible thing uh, called choice, right? You know, if you look at every living organism on this planet Earth, all of them are driven by what is called an instinctive code. A tree can only be a tree. You know, if a tree uses up all the nutrients of the soil in which or in the place or in the pot in which it's been planted, the tree cannot think its way out of it, right? It cannot be creative. It cannot think outside the box. If you think about a geese, um, geese in the winter, the geese have to fly south. If you say to a geese, look, 
it's probably not best. The weather, there's going to be a storm and the weather isn't looking very good south. The geese will ignore you and think you're a nutcase and still end up going south, regardless, right? G geese can't analyze. They can't come up with choice. They can't plan anything. They simply have to abide by what is called an instinctive code. But human beings, we don't have to do that, right? We have the capacity to be and the ability to be able to look at our lives and say, this isn't working out. I've tried this and it hasn't worked out this way. You know, uh, this is, uh, I've had an incredible run of this and but it no longer serves me. You know, you may be somebody at the moment who you've had to spend the last 20 years of your life cheating, but you've got to the point now where you've matured as a male and you've got to the point where you're like, actually, I'd like to start a family, which means I can't be speaking to four, five, six, seven, seven different women. And I can't be having sex with this one, lying to this one. I just can no longer keep that life up. And I get that I've messed up. I get that, that is probably not the best way for a man to be the life that I've lived. But I have the dignity of choice. I can choose to go in a different direction and redeem my life and actually live an inspired kind of life and not necessarily a selfish kind of life. And I believe that so many of us in life don't realize that in life, our goal should not be to live for a very long time, that rather our goal should actually be to die empty. And what ends up happening is that so many of us tend to go for relief over fulfillment. Let me repeat that. Most males decide that they want to go for relief over fulfillment. In other words, if something is difficult and they don't have a, 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 a pleasurable result right now, or they cannot have an instant win right now, then to the average male, the average male says, I don't want to go down that path. I'm not, I, I don't want to do that. If we can't get the girl now, then we're not going to commit to a relationship, to dating her, to going through hard times. And I think so many of us males in today's society, we've been brought up in a world where we haven't had many role models who have conviction who understand that actually fulfillment is a higher emotional state to go for than relief. Most of us would rather go and to the bottle. Most of us would rather have a weed. Most of us would rather go and get absolutely smashed or wallow in our, in our, in our, in our, in our sorrows or commit suicide instead of actually t going and seeking advice, going and talking to people who've been through similar situations, going to a, a group where somebody can share with us their thoughts, their advice, their strategies. We, we don't want to take that road because that is a much harder road. And so, so many of us in life, what we end up doing is we end up living a life where we believe that actually our goal is to live for a really long time as opposed to die empty. We believe that the goal of, in order to consider ourselves a success, and this is what my belief system was, which is why I'm sharing it with you. I always used to believe that really to be successful in life, I had to live for a long time. But I came to an abrupt realization when all of a sudden I started meeting people and interviewing people and working with people and interacting with males who were 60, 70, 80 years of age and they were failures and they had nothing. I, I, and I started to ask myself a question. How can you be 70 years of age and you're still working in Tesco's and you're still working in co-op? And you're working 50, 60 hours at the age of 60, 70, 8 years of age. I couldn't understand that. I asked myself the question, how can a man at 60, 70, 80 years of age never have had or been in a committed relationship, never been able to find and, and connect and create an amazing bond with somebody where that person got their back? Yes, of course, women are a pain and, and we, we all have to suffer through their complaining and moaning and the high demands for us. But that there is an incredible connection that happens when you find that person to whom you can actually share your life with who looks got your back and you've got their back and will fight your battles with you somebody in which you can envision an incredible kind of life um and i ask myself how is that possible and part of it is that a lot of men believe that if i tiptoe my way through my life 
then and end up living for 50, 60, 70 years, then I will become a success. Um, but I'm here to tell you that really in your own life, I ask you to adopt the philosophy which I've adopted, which is that actually I would much rather live for 30 years full of joy, full of passion, full of really on what I call a Duracell life, right? You've seen those Duracell adverts on television where your life is full of energy, is full of passion, is full of vigor. You've got good times. You've had bad times. You've experienced love. You've fallen out of love. You've gone after your dreams. Sometimes they haven't worked out, but you've lived your life fully, right? Brendan Burchard calls it a charged life where you have your life on as if your, your, your phone battery has been fully charged and, you, have, and you, you just go for it. That's what I encourage you to really live your life. Because here's the next thing that I have found that I, I, I found really interesting. You know, I read a book by a woman called Bonnie Ware. Bonnie Ware wrote a, a fascinating book in 2011. The book was called um, uh, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And in this book, Bonnie Ware essentially shares with us, uh, after working with 20, for 20 years with people who basically had got to the end of their life and they'd realised, I'm going to die. So I don't want to die in a hospital, I want to die in my own home. And so Bonnie's job was to look after these people all the way to the end of their lives for a period of 20 years. And she kept journals and she kept... Um, notes about things that they talk about, things that they'd share with her. And she realized after a 20 year career that these people all had the same similar kind of regrets. Let me share with you those five regrets. So the first regret that people who were dying had was that they'd wish a life where, that they wish that they'd lived a life where they'd had the courage to live a life which was true to them. The second was, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. The third was, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. The fourth, I wish I'd had the courage to stay in touch with my friends. And the fifth is, I wish I had let myself be happier. Now, isn't it interesting that one of those regrets is that many people have the regret that they wish that they'd lived they'd had the courage to live a life which was true to them and not the one that other people expected of them. And I think a lot of us, we do, in the pursuit to be liked, in the pursuit to get affirmation, to fit in, in to have a comfortable life, many of us end up settling for less than what we deserve. Many of us actually end up underperforming. It is for this reason why I say to people all the time, that for many years I actually made a mistake. Because the mistake that I made was that I thought that the wealthiest places on this planet were number one, I actually thought that the wealthiest place on this planet were the, um, the oil fields of Iraq. You know, we had or Iraq or Iran. You know, we had the Iraq war, so I thought they must be there somewhere. Then at times I thought, do you know what? In my, I watched a film called Blood Diamond and I thought, do you know what? One of the wealthiest places on this planet must be those uh, diamond mines in South, America, in, in, in South Africa. But, but after years and years and years of now looking at this, I've come to realize that actually the wealthiest place on this planet is a place which is very near your, where you live right now. Because I believe that the wealthiest place on this planet is a graveyard. And the reason why I believe that the graveyard is the wealthiest place on the planet is because so many people end up dying full. So many people have dreams, goals, ambitions, businesses, cures, solutions to, to things that they could have solved but they never pursued them, they never realized them, they never manifested them, they never ended up fulfilling those dreams, those desires, those ambitions in the very brief time that we as human beings have on this planet and they ended up taking them, all of that stuff that they had, to the graveyard. And I was looking at, okay, well, if the, if the graveyard is the wealthiest place on this planet, well, what is it that is buried in the graveyard? And what I discovered was that what's buried in the graveyard is this thing called potential. Potential is what makes the graveyard wealthy.
And, and, and really what I, uh, I hope you get from today and is really the message that I want to share with you is, I encourage you to live such a life that you do not have to look over your shoulder when you get to 50, 60, 70 years of age and say, I should have done that. I could have done that. I should have pursued that. Man, I, do you know what? I could have become that if only I'd gone for it. Because I spend an incredible amount of time around people who are 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age. And you will be shocked at the amount of times I ask him questions about advice that they'd give to their younger self. And so many of them say, I wish I'd worked harder. I wish I'd, uh, I'd followed my dreams. I'd wish I'd fallen in love. I wish I'd kept fighting for that relationship. And, 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 and what I encourage you to do is... From today, as you've listened to me, I encourage you to step into your life and to move forward into your life with an intentional mindset where you say every time an opportunity arrives or an opportunity presents itself where you have to make a choice between what is comfortable and what is going to allow you to live a life where you don't have to look over your shoulder, I ask you to go for the path that is going to allow you not to have those regrets, not to look over your shoulder and constantly say, I wish I'd done that. But also attached to that is around character. You know, you want to live the kind of life when, where when you're 50, 60, 70 years of age and you have grandkids who are asking you, or oh, granddad, how did you do with this? Or you have children and they're asking you, dad, how did you do with this? that you can say boldly, this is how I dealt with it, instead of kind of turn, looking over your shoulder and thinking, yeah, well, at that time I should not, do you know what, I should have just let go of that. I should have just forgiven somebody. You know, I shouldn't have manipulated this person. I shouldn't have treated this person this way. And as I say, the easier route, most people choose to go for the easier route, which is relief over the fulfillment. And I ask you to pursue the fulfillment route. Go down what is going to allow you to, full, to feel full, be fulfilled in your life. And usually what allows you to be fulfilled isn't instant, it's difficult, it's hard. In fact, I'll share with you a secret that I share with people whenever I coach them. When I coach people, I share with them all the time that one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people don't live up to their potential, why they don't live these incredible lives that they're capable of living, is in part because they don't want to be seen to be starting small. Most guys don't want to be seen to be a beginner again. They don't want to go back to school if they didn't pass their GCSEs. They don't want to leave a relationship and then be seen single. They don't want to give up their high lifestyle so that they can live a simpler lifestyle but be able to live happier lives. Most guys would not give up the really high paying job which is stressing them out where they're working 80 hours a week to be able to take a lower paying job so that they can spend more time with their family which is what matters. I love something that somebody once said when they say don't major in minor things. Many of us end up living our lives majoring in minor things. We spend our lives doing things and, and, and operating in areas where they really don't have any fruit in our lives. They really don't have meaning. They really don't allow, enrich us. They don't allow us to elevate our thinking, elevate our emotional being, ele elevate our spirituality, touch the, the human soul. Right, So that we can live this incredible enriched kind of life which every single one of us human beings has a capacity to be able to do. And so I would ask you to ask yourself whether that is you. Because I think one of the other reasons why so many people uh, don't end up fulfilling their highest fullest expression of themselves and they end up um, looking over their shoulder and they end up spending a life where... They uh, they never actually they, they take two steps forward, but they ended up taking five steps backwards. They never seem to get a break, that lucky break. They never seem to have a breakthrough. They never seem to become champions in their own lives to win in areas of their own lives. Sometimes they get fluky and they win, but they're not consistently winning in their relationships, in their friendships, in their connections, in their workplaces. 
one of the reasons I believe that is, is because I believe that so many of us don't are trying to get the approval of our parents. So many of us are trying to get the approval of the people who uh, love us and whose opinion matters the most. But let me share with you something that has been a major life lesson that I have learned in my life. I have come to understand that one of the greatest gifts, in fact, I would say the highest gift that you can give your parents, that you can give people who matter to you, whose opinion actually counts in your life, is to become everything that you were meant to become. You know, most of us think that if I give my parents a grandchild, if I become a CEO, if I graduate from university, then that is what is going to uh, make my parents proud. That is what's going to uh, allow me, for, for people in my life, for them to say, you've done great, wow. I disagree. I believe that the highest level that you can reach and the greatest gift that you can give your parents in terms of uh, their approval is truly to become who you are. And let me explain to you why I believe this. I believe this because I believe that every parent, what they really want to know at the center of who they are when, it, when it's concerning their children is will they be okay? Will my children be, if, if something God forbid was to ever happen to me, would my baby be okay? Would my son be okay? Would my daughter be okay? Would they be able to fight through? Would they be able to go ahead and live an abundant life? That's really what every parent at the center of who they are is trying to, to get and, and, and trying to, uh, to really get to the point of emotionally and psychologically. It's part of the reason why parents steer their children and manipulate their children into going to university, into going in certain relationships, because they're worried. Are you going to be single? Are you going to find a job? Are you going to be able to build your own home? Are you going to be able to build your own family? They're worried about that. And the way you alleviate that stress, you alleviate and release that pressure off them, is to be who you are meant to become, to live up to your highest potential and so many of us don't do that and shall I tell you one of the other things that I think is really important in in connected to that I believe that if you don't end up being who you are and you don't end up realizing your potential one of the other issues that you're going to face in your life is that you're going to face the fact that you are never truly going to be able to reach one of the highest acts of what it means to be a man. Now we're just talking about manhood here, but let me share with you what I believe is the highest act of manhood. I believe that the highest act of manhood, this is the highest you can go as a man, is to recognize another human being for their existence. I believe that when you can get to the point in your life where you're not selfish enough, that it's all about you, and you actually recognize somebody else as existing. And you say, I hear you. I know how you feel. No, 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 no. You're not crazy. I've felt like that before too. No, 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 no. You're not mad. I believe you. No, no, no. You're not crazy. You're not the only person who's gone through that. I've also gone through that. And the issue is, you can't even get to that stage Unless you start looking at yourself, unless you start working on yourself, unless you start evaluating yourself, unless you grow into who you realize yourself, you grow into who you are meant to become. And what I want to share with you is, so many of us end up living this life where we never end up stepping into that. We never end up becoming who we're meant to become. We never end up realizing all these incredible gifts, these incredible uh, skills that we can acquire, and all of the fruit that is available to actually realize in the life that we've got. You know, many of you guys who are listening to me, you still to this day don't understand how brief life is. One of the greatest lessons that I have learned from people who are much older than me is that I've come to learn that time actually accelerates the older you get. So when you're like 12, three weeks when you're 12 is like seven months. But as you get older, three weeks moves like that, right? 
everything just accelerates. And what I would share with you is, if you're not careful and you don't pay attention to your life and you don't start living intentionally, what's going to end up happening is, is you're going to get to a point in your life where you're going to be looking over your shoulder. You're going to be living a life of regret. There's a saying that says that most people are buried, die at age 25, but are not buried until age 75. Let, let me repeat that statement. It's one of the notes that I wrote down here. Most men die at age 25, but are not buried until age 75. Most of the men and the lads in, the, in your life that you know are never going to change. They're not going to change. This is it. You can almost see where they're going to be in, 10, in 30, 40, 50, 60 years. They're never going to grow beyond where they currently are. I remember that one of the greatest lessons that I have learned in my life and has been a guiding force in my life is to realize that whilst change is going to happen naturally, you're going to change, right? Politics are going to change. The weather will change. Your skin will fade naturally. Your, your, your skin is going to get shabby and loose. All of those changes will happen naturally, but growth has to be intentional. A tree cannot grow by itself. You, it needs water, it needs sunlight. Do you understand where I'm going with this? It needs nurturing. It's the same for human beings. In order for human beings to grow emotionally, spiritually, in order for us to grow, to become empathetic, to become more loving, to become more kind, to become more understanding, all of those things do not happen, they're not inherent, they do not happen naturally. All of those are things which we have to be intentional about and which we have to build. And so what I want to encourage you in your life is to really begin to become intentional, is to really begin to start actually growing. Because there is a lot more to you than what we see. And you may not even realize that. Most people don't realize that what we see is simply a tip of the iceberg. You have not done everything that you're capable of doing. The person who we see today is simply a result of what you've done so far. Potential is what you've done, but haven't done yet. If you're still alive, then there is more for you to do. When you get to a point in your life where you're dead, then that means there is no more for you to do. There is no more. And, I, and going back to one of the first points that I made, which is that a lot of us, we don't realize that just because we've lived for 30 years, we may have been fulfilled. We may have done everything that we're supposed to do. Most of us make the mistake and we think, well, clearly, if I've only lived 30 years and I die, that I haven't lived an incredible life. That is not true. There are people who've died at age 40, but they've lived four lifetimes in that time. And there are people who've lived 70 years who've not even lived one lifetime. They've never fallen in love. They've never been in a relationship. They've never gone traveling outside of their country. They've never spoken to anyone who's outside of their race, their political viewpoint. They've never experienced life. It's, it's insane. I mean, literally just the other day, I was journaling about this because I was having multiple conversations with people recently and I cannot tell you of the amount of people who've never actually gone to London. There are many people who live in the UK and they've never been to London. They've never been on the London Eye. They've never been to the London Zoo, right? They've never been to the London Aquarium. They've never been anywhere near Houses of Parliament. Some people live in this country and they've never been to Brighton Beach. They've never been to Bournemouth. They've never been to Scotland. They've never been to Wales. And, and, and it's kind of fascinating when you think about that. It's because it's like, how can you be over the age of 18 and in your more than 18 years, you've never met other people. You've never traveled. I mean, I asked somebody the other day, I said, you live in Reading and Reading is probably in... In the UK, one of the most cosmopolitan places I've ever been. There's Hindus, there's Blacks, there's Chinese, there's Nepalese, there's Romanians, there's Lithuanians. You've got Polish food. You've got a cosmopolitan and an, 
a, a, an accumulation of loads of different types of people. And I said to him, have you ever gone and ate with a black family or, or, or a Lithuanian family or Polish family to see what do they eat? What, what's their culture? Do they eat at the dinner table? Do, do they share the food in the middle? Do they all have individual plates? What kind of food do they eat? And he was like, I've never done that. And I was like, how is that even possible? Right? So that means the world that you see is simply from the viewpoint of your home. You go home, you go to work, you go shopping, you go home, and that's kind of it. The guy hasn't even left this country. And I thought to myself, how could you not even, he doesn't even have a passport. So how do you know what the world is outside of this country? How do other cultures work? What languages do other people speak? What are their mannerisms? What is normal? And he's never experienced any of that. And that's why I say most people die at age 25 but are not buried until age 75 because most lads have, will never experience anything beyond themselves. And actually, when we start to look at wisdom, and we start to look at, because wisdom is one of the highest the highest emotional states and the highest, highest psychological states that a man can get to, to get to wisdom, right? Where he can make wise decisions. And you cannot get to wisdom unless you are confronted with things that oppose what you believe, with people who oppose the way that you live. And a lot of people have never met anybody who opposes their political uh, views and being friends with them, who opposes their religious views and being friends with them, who opposes their traditions, who opposes their lifestyle. A lot of us simply hang around with people who are like us, who believe the same things as us, who see the world the same way that we do, which means that we cannot grow, we cannot become wiser, we cannot make better decisions. I remember, and I've shared this story many, many, many times, and I was studying um, a guy called Tim Schmidt. Tim Schmidt um, was one of the co-founders of uh, the Eden Project in Cornwall um, in the UK and he co-founded this Eden Project which is a botanical gardens and he was sharing, I was studying him and he was sharing this story about how he goes to so many different seminars and, and all these kind of workshops and conferences and whenever he turns up at these conferences people ask him, oh you know how are we going to make the world a safer place? And, oh, this next generation, they're destroying this and they're destroying that. And he said, he said a profound piece of information that I'll never forget. He said, I always get irritated when people ask me how are we going to cure global warming. And I always say to them that we do not need to worry about the world. The world has this ecosystem which will eventually level itself out and balance itself out. The problem that we need to worry about is the children, the people who are leaving into the world. Because those are the ones who are going to destroy um, the animals, who are going to destroy the oceans, who are going to eat too much, who are going to basically uh, uh, overpopulate places, who are going to use things that don't, and overuse things that don't need to be overused who are not going to keep the world in this balance that has already been formed on the planet. Um, and, and I say to you that as a man, as a male, you there are going to be people who are coming up behind you and they're going to be looking at you for what it means to be a man. How do you make decisions? What is good? What is bad? Um, they're going to be looking at you and trying to determine, well, what is a man supposed to be like? What is success? What is failure? How should we treat women? How should we treat men? How should we treat people who are gay? How should we treat people who are conservative? How should we treat people who like dogs but we don't like dogs? How should we treat people who uh, have a lifestyle where they do drugs? They're going to be looking to you, whether it's going to be your neighbor, whether it's going to be people in your workplace, they're going to be looking to you to show them what is normal. You know, at the moment, I work in a warehouse and the predominant people in that warehouse are, are all around 17, 18, 19 years of age. And they're constantly asking me questions about well, what is success? What do you think about religion? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because they don't know yet. Right? They haven't formed their opinions. They don't, they don't, they're trying to figure out how the world works and how it functions. 
Um, and this is why I'm sharing with you this significance because many of you work in places and you don't even realize that there are young people who are looking at you right now and they, you are showing them, whether you realize it or not, what a man should be. You're showing them how people's sh lifestyle should be. You're showing them whether they should turn up to work on time. You're showing them whether they should be speaking to multiple women. You're showing them whether on their break they should be having conversations with their colleagues on their break or they should be on their phone. All the time you're showing them. You're showing them should you be going for three, four break, cigarette breaks in your break or not. And many males don't get this. We don't realize this and the impact that we have on other people. And, and that's why I say when you begin to get into wisdom, when you begin to live an intentional life, you begin to realize that there are consequences to every single choice and that everything is connected and that everything matters. My question to you is, do you realize that everything matters? Do you realize that everything is connected? Do you realize that there are people looking to you and they're saying, I don't want to be like you or I want to be more like you? Do you realize that? I love there is a saying that says that the biggest enemy that you have to deal with is yourself. There is an African proverb that says, if there is no enemy within, then the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. One of the other notes that I wrote down here is that the biggest enemy to progress is your last success. You can become so proud of what you've already accomplished that you stop moving ahead to what you can still do. And many of you males, many of you guys who are listening to me, this is a place in which you're operating your life from. You've never actually realized that there is a lot more that you can do. You've been so proud of the progress you've made that you no longer even bother trying to use and utilize all the resources at your disposal. I was having a conversation with a guy uh, d the day before yesterday or yesterday and I was saying to him that most people in the UK do not realize the value that they have because I said to him that much of the problems that Africa has, that India has, that Nepal has can be solved by people who do not consider themselves clever in the UK. If an English person went to Africa, went to Nepal, went to India and they had a doctor's or a nurse degree or qualification, they would be more advanced than somebody in that country. If somebody in this country who's been to university and done media or done marketing went to Africa or went to India or went to Nepal, or went to Venezuela, they would be more of an asset in that country than they would do in England. And I was saying to him that most of the problems, if we wanted to accelerate the progress that is done in Africa and solve the poverty, the logistical problems, the corruption problems, we need to get people from the UK who've lived here, who've understand the logistics and what, and what we take for granted and go back to Africa and teach it to people in Africa. Because people in Africa lack knowledge, they lack information. They don't have, you know, most of Africa doesn't even have Wi-Fi. They cannot gain access to how business works, to how funds work, to investors. All of this stuff you do, that we take for granted in the UK does not exist in Africa. Um, and, and what I would share with you is, you can have made so much progress in your life that you actually have stopped progressing anymore because you think you're done. You think that you've done everything that you're supposed to do. You know, I came up with this, um, with these, what I call the six stages of life. And the first, uh, because basically I studied so many successful people that I began to see that a lot of people kept saying, well, this is the maximum that I can do. But I had studied so many people that I always realized there was another stage that people can go at. And the bottom two stages of, those, of that pyramid or those stages are the first stage on the bottom of that pyramid, which is, I guess you could call it the first stage, is what I call survival. And then from survival, you move to what I call security. And for a lot of people, particularly those of you lads in the UK who live in England, Scotland and Wales and Ireland, you 
are operating at what I call security. Security is where you have a little bit, you know, you have a relationship, you have some money, you have a job, you can go traveling. And so what, instead of growing your relationship, instead of progressing it, instead of um, educating yourself to a higher level, even though you've got, instead of going for a PhD now that you've got your A-levels, instead of going for a management role now that you've got a stable job, most people stay in that security role where they basically end up trying to what I call maintain their life instead of growing their life. This is why I talk about so many people dying full. So many people taking all that potential with them to the graveyard because they've, they've got to the point where they've, their progress has actually, sorry, their success has actually stopped their progress. So like, Kasim, I've done good, man. I earn 50 grand a year. Most of my friends don't earn 50 grand a year. But, but let me share something with you which I found to be really useful in my own life. Let me share this with you. I found that whilst all human beings are equal, we do not have the same capacity. Let me repeat what I've just said because th this is important. Whilst every human being, white, black, Chinese, gay, straight, likes rock music, likes reggae, um, likes smoking weed, likes doing coke, likes drinking alcohol, likes painting, likes dubstep, I don't know, you name it, likes McDonald's, likes Nando's, likes Wagamama's, whilst every single one of the, any of these individuals is equal, in the eyes of God, all of us are equal, in the eyes of the law, all of us are equal, we don't all have the same capacity. Me and you saying, but I could train, I'm telling you, for two or three years with the best trainers on this planet, but I'm telling you that if, I, if me and you saying, but go into a race, he's going to beat me. He may not even have to train as much as me, and he would still beat me. Now, that doesn't mean that you saying, but is better than me, but what it does mean is that his capacity in the area of running, in that area, is much bigger than mine. But then let's take it further. If me and Usain Bolt got into a conversation or we got into a, a, some kind of a, a thing about talking, I'm going to win. I can out-talk him. I love talking. I, it's part of the reason why I do these videos, because I love talking. And I have all this information that I've gained and this experience that actually I've got to the point where it's almost... I, uh, this is a bit bizarre. I didn't plan to tell you this, but I think it would be interesting for you. I've got to the point in my life where a bit like an artist where you have so much music inside of you that it drives you nuts that it's, you've got the an artist has to get to the point where they just have to write the music they have to play this song they have to make the music because it just drives them mental and I was explaining to somebody the other day that I got to the point where I have so much information I have so much to give people that I it, it drives me nuts not to share it with people because I see people suffering and, and, and I see people making erroneous decisions and choices that they can easily rectify. I see people struggling that don't need to struggle and I want to help them. You know, people say to me, Kasim, some of your videos only get like 10 views, 15 views, 50 views. Why do you still do your videos? I do them because my goal isn't to be famous. I don't care about getting millions of views. I do it because if I can help even one person, I'm done. I, I, I've got to get this information out. I don't want to keep it. I, 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 it, it. Honestly, it drives me crazy to have this information inside of me. That's part of the reason why... Even though I didn't want to become a speaker, even though I didn't want to write books, I have no freaking choice but to write books. Because I have to get all of these ideas, all of this information uh, out to somebody. Even if nobody even gets it. I mean, I've wrote so many books now, and I've never published any of them. But I needed to write them just to get them off my chest, right? Part of the reason why I have so many different journals is because I think of so many different ideas and I have to put them down. I just, I can't keep them in my mind. They drive me a bit crazy. So, going back to my point, so many of you guys, you've never got to the point where you realize that you have all this incredible talent. You've never realized that you have all this amazing capacity to do the most incredible things. Human beings have this amazing ability for creativity, for discipline, for love, for planning, for empathy, and for envisioning 
that other species cannot do, right? It's interesting. One of the notes that I wrote down here is that uh, human beings have the capacity to turn wheat into a garden. We can take pennies, turn, take pennies and turn them into fortune. We can take disaster and turn it into the most unbelievable future, not only for ourselves, but other people. And I challenge you over the next kind of decade to really look at that. You have the ability to take weeds and turn them into a garden, to take uh, misfortune and pennies and turn them into fortune and greatness, to be able to take disaster and turn it into this incredible, enriched, fruitful, unbelievable kind of life, which not only inspires you, but also inspires the people around you. The other comment that I wanted to leave, leave with you, um, a note that I made on here is, actually comes from a quote by Superman. Let me read it to you. It goes like this. They can be of great people, Carlisle, if they wish to be. They only lack the light to show them the way. For this reason, above all, their capacity for good. You know, many people end up living their life looking over their shoulder because so many people don't understand that we can actually change. You know, I have these conversations all the time with people. People say to me, Kasim, I'm selfish. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of person that I'm selfish. And I don't want to help other people. And I don't want to go and make loads of money to help other people. And I say, that's okay. Well, you can decide now if you want to and go in a completely different path. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if you've been selfish before, you can decide now after our conversation that you don't want to be selfish anymore. And you can go in a different direction. If... You've been a cheater all the last 20 years of your life. You can decide now, okay, well, I don't want to be a cheater anymore. I'm going a different direction. And so many guys don't get this. Human beings, we have this amazing capacity for love. We have this amazing capacity for empathy, for contribution, for sharing. People don't understand that really, you know, I looked at a question which was, what is life all about? Why are we here? Why do humans exist? And one of the answers that I found to this question is that human beings are here in one way or another to help elevate other people. You know, what happens, let me ask you this question, what happens when you go and watch a really good movie? What's the first thing that you do? You want to go and tell everybody about it. If you go and something amazing happens to you, um, maybe you, um, I don't know, flipped a bottle by accident, but the bottle landed in a really good position. What's one of the first things you want to, you look around to see who else you can tell what, and somebody who can recognize what you've just done, right? Human beings, we're natural sharers. We want to help other people. We want to elevate other people. But we've grown up in this world where most of us have not had role models that have encouraged us to lean towards that, to lean towards that direction. Most of us have been brought up in a world where we lean towards selfishness. It's all about me. What can I get? How far can I reach? How much can I have? I challenge you from today to be intentional to lead into the life which says, how can I serve you? How can I help you? In what way can I improve your life? Because actually, all the great things of life that all of us are seeking to fulfill our needs and our desires all lie on this side of how can I serve you? How can I help you? I love uh, one question was asked many years ago which was asked, how can we achieve great power, great influence, great abundance, great wealth? How can we achieve loads of loads of fortune, to great influence to be able to impact other people's lives? How can we do that? And the answer was this, find a way to serve the many, for service to many will lead to greatness. Now, I know that many of you are going to lead, listen to that and say, well, Kasim, how can I help other people if I have nothing? The, 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 the answer was find a way find a way human beings are creative we have the capacity to turn something which is really very little or nothing into something amazing we have the capacity to take your life where you have really nothing at the moment and you can build an incredible life you can acquire new skills build the teams you can find the people all of this you can do by being the kind of person who's resourceful 
Most people think that in order to be successful, in order to reach what we want, we need resources. And you do many times. But actually, the biggest resource you can get is resourcefulness. To think outside of the box. A tree cannot think outside of the box. Nor can geese. Nor can dogs. But you can. You can think outside of the box and, in, and, and build anything that you want to build. Anything is possible if you believe it is. Will Smith once said that he who thinks he can and he who thinks he can't are both usually right. If you say it's impossible, then it is. Because if you say something is impossible, are you going to try it? Of course you're not going to try it. But if you say that it is possible or, or you just have faith and actually lean towards the fact that it's possible, you give it a try. And you have a more higher chance of achieving something if you give it a try than not trying it at all. Because when you don't try it at all, you end up living a life where you're relying on luck. And when luck doesn't come through, you end up becoming resentful because you see all other people getting everything. They are wealthy. They have more than uh, relationships. And all of a sudden, you start believing that you're deficient, that in some way you're unworthy because they seem to have everything that you want and they seem to be lucky and they seem to get it really easily. No, they had the courage to believe in something higher than themselves that they couldn't prove right now. And I wonder if you are the kind of person that I am talking about when I discuss that. I ask you to really reach down inside of yourself. Bring out some more of those remarkable gifts that you have. Bring out some more of those talents, those gifts that you have inside of you. They're there. They're definitely there. Bring out that empathy. Bring out that understanding. Bring out and go and acquire some more of the skills that you need, the teams, the, uh, the communication for your relationships. All of that stuff is inside of you. The great, one of the great principles and the great lessons that has withstood time is that everything you need is inside of you. Every religion, every spiritual leader, every great writer throughout history agrees on this one thing. Everything you need is inside of you. You've heard it in movies, you've read it in books, you've read it in stories, you had it told over and over and over again, but most of us still don't get it. Everything you need is inside of you. The moment you take a pause, you look inside, you examine, and you act on faith, is the moment that you start unlocking. Is the moment you start unlocking that roar, that potential, that lion, which is dormant inside of you, which is residing, right? That's when you release, the, is where you add uh, gas to, to the fire. And all of a sudden, this incredible life begins to become fruitful, begins to erupt in your life. This is where you get people who they say they're overnight successes, right? Believing, hanging on, fighting for stuff, working diligently through stuff is where all of a sudden you become lucky, where people just say you're an overnight success. That, my friends, is the kind of life that I wish for you and I encourage you to pursue so that you can get to the point in your life where you're not looking over your shoulder. And that concludes what I wanted to share with you. Um, I want to take this moment to thank you so much for watching. I don't know whether what I shared with you today and my notes have been useful. Um, if it has, then like this, share it with somebody who needs to hear it. Um, and as I said at the beginning, uh, like and subscribe to my channel Casimotive on YouTube to support me. But apart from that, I thank you so much for watching and I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now.